So it's a longer passage today. We're not going to read every single verse. We're going to read a good bit of it, but we're not going to read every single verse. But if you've got your place in Deuteronomy 2, if you'll stand with me, we're going to begin reading in verse 1 of of Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 1. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord told me. This is Moses speaking. And for many days we traveled around Mount Seir. Then the Lord said to me, You have been traveling around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward and command the people. You are about to pass through the territory of your brothers, the people of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you, so be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall purchase food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. So we went on away from our brothers, the people of Esau, who lived in Seir, away from the Arabo road from Elath and Ezion Geber. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to the Hebrew people. But, God, we even see your faithfulness to others, Lord. And we see that, God, you are God of all, sovereign over all. And, Lord, even to people, as we're going to see, that we're not your covenant people, you still provided for them. And God, we praise you for that, Lord. In your goodness and in your common grace, you gave lands to them, Father. Lord, we pray this morning, Father, that we would see you more clearly, that we would grow to love you more. And God, most of all, that we would appreciate what Christ has done for us even more, Lord God. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. So our main idea of the sermon this morning is that we can trust God because he is faithful to his people and to himself. We can trust God because he is faithful to his people and to himself. So the first place or the first way that we see that God is faithful or understand that he is faithful, we see in this passage that God is faithful in the wilderness. God is faithful in the wilderness. Verse 1 again of chapter 2. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord told me. And for many days we traveled around Mount Seir. Then the Lord said to me, you have been traveling around this mountain country long enough. So we pick up right where we left off last week, and we see that things aren't as they ought to be. God has given them a specific instruction, turn around and go. And they're going in the opposite direction of where they're supposed to be, away from the promised land, back toward the Red Sea. They're taking a 180 and turning. Verse 4, turn northward and command the people. You are about to pass through the territory of your brothers, the people of Esau who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall purchase food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in the work of all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. So we went on away from our brothers, the people of Esau, who lived in Seir, away from Arabah Road, away from the Arabah Road, from Elath and from Azion Geber. And we turned and went in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said to me, do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession, because I have given R to the people of Lot for a possession. So if you're looking on your map, you see uh, at first, their first attempt to go into the promised land happened right there. We, we, we saw last week, um, they're kind of uh, uh, west of the Dead Sea there. We don't know why they're now going in a different direction. But as we're seeing, God is is leading them in a place that's going to strategically help them as they're going to invade and go in and possess Canaan. They're across the Jordan River. And so the first couple places we see here are Edom and the place of Moab. And God is specific in telling them not to attack them. 
And as we are told, the people of Edom or the Edomites are the descendants of Esau, who was the brother of Jacob, who was the grandson of Abraham. This should be causing bells to go off. These are their family here. But we need to point out, and of course, Lot was also the uncle of Abraham. He mentions Lot specifically as they're going to move into Moab. That's where his people live. And we need to point out that God has given land to these families, to Esau's family, to Lot's families, even though they're not part of the covenant people of God. They were related to the same family, but they were still not part of God's covenant. Yet God had given them land. God had provided for that. And God is telling the Israelites, I didn't give you this land, so don't take it. This is not for you to possess. This was for Esau's family. I'm going to give you another land. I'm going to give you other land, land other than this. And it shows us that God, I think Moses is specific in telling us that God is God all over the earth. Pagan gods that these people would have worshipped, they believed that these gods were territorial. That the gods that the Edomites worshipped were only sovereign or over, only had power in Edom. But Moses is telling us, no, Yahweh, the God that we worship, is God over all of it. And so we see that for a moment, again, God is sovereign over all of this. And let's remember for a moment who's listening to Moses here. Because remember, we're, we're going ahead to the future. Remember, God had told them that the generation that rebelled against God wouldn't see the promised land. So those who are about to move into the promised land are all relatively young. The people who would have been children that would have remembered the exodus, that would have remembered the rebellion. But then there are also people who are younger than them, people who would have been born while they were in the wilderness. And God has been faithful to them. God, Moses, is, is saying, he's teaching them, as God is saying, you have been in the wilderness and you've had everything. You haven't wanted anything. He's provided food. He's provided protection. And so we get kind of a footnote as we move on in, verse, in chapter 12 and verses 10 and 12. We get a little bit of a footnote where we are told that the people of Edom, they dispossessed the people who were living there. Or the people of Esau's family dispossessed the people of Edom. And Moses is reminding them saying, look, if God helped the people of Esau dispossess the people where he was going to live, can't we trust that he's going to do the same for us? For he did this for people who are not his covenant people. He's certainly going to do it for us. And he's going to do it in his time. One of the things I, I heard a, uh, a pastor um, this week uh, share this story as he was teaching on this and he illustrated, gave this illustration. I thought it was, uh, it was pretty good. Uh, he mentioned that he had a, a younger, he has a five-year-old son. And one of the things, of course, his five-year-old son had gotten out of sorts and uh, what he gave him as his consequence, and many of us as parents has prob- have probably done this same thing. You need to go to your room, okay? For whatever you want to call it, time out, time away, okay? And uh, over time, he forgot he'd sent him up there. Okay, you get you get started doing things. Uh, you get you know no, nobody else in this room would ever do that. Um, but he he kind of forgot about having sent him to his room. Went on about his day doing what he needed to do. And before and at some point, his son kind of came down and was like, "Hey, is it okay that I I come down? I'm, I'm still up there." And he looked at him and said, "Yes, because now is the time I wanted you to come down. You need to to come down." And so the people of Israel had been in a quote-unquote timeout for 40 years, been in the wilderness. But here's the thing. God had not forgotten about them. God had a specific point in time when he wanted them to leave that wilderness. And it wasn't as though God got tired of waiting. It wasn't as though God was looking at his watch or looking at a calendar going, all right, I guess, I guess you've learned your lesson. No, from the time he sent them into the wilderness to the time they came out, God was in control of it and knew exactly when he was going to bring them out. And it's not as though they were perfect while they were in the wilderness. They still grumbled. They still sinned. Yet God was faithful to them and faithful to his promises to Abraham. 
One of the things that if you've ever seen the movies, uh, Lord of the Rings, one of the things that's at the beginning of the first movie, uh, Fellowship of the Ring, one of the characters named Frodo, they're getting ready to have a party there in the Shire. And Frodo gets on to uh, Gandalf, who is a wizard, who is a, a leadership figure in the series. And he looks at Gandalf and he says to him, he says, Gandalf, you're late. And Gandalf looks to him and says, why Frodo Baggins? He says, a wizard is never late nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. And God is that same way. His timing is perfect because he is the one who makes that decision. He accomplishes his plan when he means to. And he's not on anyone else's time frame. And time does not exist to him the way that it does to us because he sees it all at once. So when he wanted for them to come out of the wilderness, it's when they came out of the wilderness. And it was the same when he decided or when he wanted to save them spiritually. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, Paul tells us how God in his own time also saved Israel spiritually and how he also saved us spiritually Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. This is what Paul says. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So when God was ready, when he had, in the time that he had appointed, Christ entered the world. That he was the greatest provision we could ever have for our greatest need, which is forgiveness of our sin. And one of the privileges that we have when we are saved, one of the privileges that we have in the gospel of being a son of God is knowing that God is going to meet all of our needs. Jesus teaches us this in Matthew 6 when he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more than food, or the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Can any one of you, can any of you, by by worrying at a single hour to your life, If we are followers of Christ, we can cling to this promise that God will meet our needs. And as we just read in Galatians, after we are adopted and made sons in his family, that is a promise that he makes to us. And we ourselves will have times in our lives when we are in the wilderness, when we are in the desert. This could be as a result of many things. It might be a result of our sin might be the result of someone else's sin. And it's difficult because it's hard to sense God's presence when we're in the wilderness. Job expresses it this way. He says, behold, I go forward, but he is not there. Backward, and I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. And he says, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. So being in the wilderness is difficult. We will face temptations. We will face hardships. And even as Job says here, we must cling to Christ and his word. Because in the wilderness, we don't want to do the things that draw us to God or that God uses to draw us to himself. We don't want to pray. But as Job says, we treasure the words of God more than food itself. So how do we cope and how do we rely on God's faithfulness when we find ourselves in the wilderness? Well, the first thing we have to do is remember that God is the one who leads us into the wilderness. He did so with Israel, and we have to embrace it. We have to realize that he is the one that leads us into the wilderness. That's exactly what he did with Jesus in the Gospels. After his baptism, he led him into the wilderness. Even when we are in the wilderness due to our own sin or someone else's, God has a purpose in us being in the wilderness. That is something that Israel never did. They never fully embraced it. Because as we see, there was grumbling and things all throughout their time in the, in, the, in the desert. 
They begin to turn to themselves and sometimes other things for provision. And by embracing and understanding that God is working and that God has a purpose for us to be in the wilderness, we can grow in contentment. We can get to a place where we remember in knowing our future that we rely on the promises and faithfulness of God, that we can be content. And we learn that what Paul teaches us in Philippians, that whether in sickness and in health and in fullness and in want, God is faithful in all those circumstances. And we can be content, remembering that we don't live on bread alone, but on the word of God. That God is faithful to us in the wilderness. And when we know that he is faithful, we can be content until the timing is right when he will act and he will move. Secondly, we see that God is faithful to his character. God is faithful to his character. Look with me in verse 13 of chapter 2. Now rise up and go over the brook Zareed. So we went over the brook Zareed, and from the, and the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook of Zareed was 38 years, until the entire generation, that is the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn them. So if you look over to the east, uh, if you are looking at the map, you see where the creek is, it runs off of the Dead Sea, uh, where that is where they're going to cross over. It's where they're going to go into the land that is just still, again, west of the promised land, west of Canaan. Verse 15, for indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. So as soon as all the men of war had perished and were dead from among the people, the Lord said to me, today you are to cross the border of Moab at Ar. So notice who is going to receive the glory here. Not the people of Israel, but the people of God. And he specifically tells them to wait until the men of war have died before telling the Israelites to cross over this river, before crossing over this Zareed. So I think there's a twofold purpose here that's going on. One is we're seeing that these people, God's calling them men of war. But were they men of war? No, they were not. These men of war had no courage and they rebelled against God. But yet at the same time, this seems... Strange to us, we're going to wait till the men of war are dead and then move into the land? So it has to be that God's going to be the one that's going to fight the victory for them or fight the battle for them. So these people who have never fought any battles are now given the task of going in and conquering the land. But we are seeing here also that God is faithful and true to his own character because he means what he says. And in this moment, what I'm referring to is his holiness and his justice. God is not full of empty threats or empty promises. When he says he won't allow them into the land until all of the rebellious people are gone, he means that. We can be certain, even though we, just as though we can be certain that his promises to care for us and provide for us will come true, we can also know that his other promises will come to pass as well, that this whole generation is going to die before they go into the promised land. Amos 9-7 reminds us that apart from God, Israel is no different than any other group of people that was around during this time. All groups migrated. All groups, many other groups dispossessed others, but only one group had God's favor. And with that comes responsibility to be obedient. One of the things that we'll deal with in a bit is the violence that God pours out on people in this time. But one of the things we cannot miss is that one of the recipients of God's people was Israel themselves. Their rebellion made God their enemy. Let that sit on you for just a moment. This God that they were in covenant with had become their enemy. This people who had rebelled. The God who had poured out judgment on the Egyptians now poured out his judgment on Israel because they they refused to enter the land. These are the groups of people. These are the men of war that he's speaking about. And we see throughout the book of Numbers how God took out these people that rebelled through different means. 
God is holy. He cannot endure sin. Psalm 5, 4 says that God is holy and wickedness or evil cannot dwell with him. He has to get rid of it. It can't exist with him. Not a shred of it. There's a, a fable that you might remember, you might have read in school uh, that illustrates this, I think, very well. Uh, there was a, a scorpion and a frog, and they both needed to, the scorpion needed help getting across the river. And so the scorpion asked the frog to carry him across, and of course the frog hesitates because he knows, he's afraid that the scorpion might sting him. But the scorpion says, I can't sting you because if I were to sting you, it's going to kill you, and if it kills you, then... I'll go under with you and we'll both drown. And so the frog agrees. He says, all right, hop on my back and I'll I'll help you get across. And then about midway through the river, the scorpion, true to his nature, stings the frog. The frog says, why did you do that? Why did you sting me? Now we're both going to die because I'm going to die before you get across and you're going to sink with me into the river and you're going to die as well. And the scorpion replies to him, I couldn't help it. It's in my nature. He couldn't deny himself. Now that doesn't hold up to this exactly. God is not impulsive. We know that. And God's purposes are good. Okay. Not to harm us, not certainly not to harm himself. We know that God's intentions are never evil. But God still can't deny his nature. And God has to be faithful to his character, all aspects of his character. And this truth is still with us today. Those of us who are not in Christ, who reject God's grace, are in the same shape as the Israelites who rebelled. Those, as Scripture teaches, who die without putting their faith in Christ for salvation, they face an eternity of separation from God. Or in Matthew 26 tells us that this eternity says it's a place where the Lord cast them into a place of fire built for Satan and his demons. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. And we'll see again how this happens. Revelation chapter 20, we know this as the final judgment or the judgment of the, of the great right throne, as it's sometimes called. Revelation 20. In your notes, uh, it begins at verse 13, but I'm actually going to start in verse 11 of Revelation 20. Then I saw a great great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Excuse me. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Friends, this is a coming reality. We believe and trust in the authority of Scripture, and so we must soberly acknowledge what the Bible is teaching here and acknowledge that it will happen one day because God is going to be faithful to accomplish what we're reading in Revelation 20, just as he did in Deuteronomy 2, just as he does in the Gospels. This will come to pass. Yet John gives us another aspect of God's character. He tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John gives us both sides of this coin. God's justice is what allows him to forgive us our sins. And you say, how can that be? It's because he meted out his justice on Christ. Yes, sin must be dealt with. And God's justice must be met. But because of Christ, we don't have to endure that. And the way we are judged, if we are in Christ, Christ is the one who is judged, not us. And that is how our name will be found in the Lamb's book of life. When he says here what they have done, we'll be able, those of us who are in Christ will be able to stand there and say, it's not what I did, it's what he did. And praise God. And John tells us in 1 John that if we confess our sins, if we agree with him that we are sinners and trust Christ for salvation through his death and resurrection, God will purify us from all of our sin and our wrongdoing. 
And this purification and regeneration is what puts our name in the book of life. All of our deeds are not weighed. There's one deed that's weighed, and that was Jesus' deed. And this is, in some sense, what we're seeing happen in Israel here. There is a purification. There is a purging of those who rebelled. And once they were purged, once they were removed, then those who remained were able to go into the land. Again, because God is faithful to his character. But for those who do not believe in Christ, they are, you are still in the wilderness, still wandering in the wilderness of your sin. You are a sheep without a shepherd, still aimless and hopeless. And so remember the story that we see of those who were not faithful and did rebel. God is again true to his character. So if there is a stirring or a conviction of your sin and separation from God, answer it and fall on the grace of Jesus. Acknowledge that the only way you can be in God's presence is because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. He came into the world, his own wilderness, so to speak, away from his glory and endured a punishment that was meant for us. So if we confess our sin and call on Jesus for forgiveness, we receive that his mercy and in his grace, which he is full of, which allows us to repent our sin and to run to him. But for those of us who are in Christ, this should also compel us to go to the world with the gospel. Again, if we trust in the promises of God, which means that we know that God will be faithful to what he's showing John in Revelation 20, then that should chill us and give us urgency to go to those, to go to those with the hope of the gospel. God is faithful to his character. And we also see that God is faithful to fight his enemies. Our third way we see that God is faithful is that God is faithful to fight our enemies. Look with me in chapter 2, verse 24 of Deuteronomy. This is God speaking. Rise up, set out on your journey, and go over to the valley of Arnon. Behold, I have given into your hand Sion the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to take possession and contend with him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you on the peoples who are under the whole heaven, who shall hear the report of you and tremble and be in anguish because of you or of you. So now they have crossed the river Zerid, and they are going up into the land that is west of Canaan, and they're going to have to contend with people there in battle. Moses shares here how he sends messengers to ask for safe passage, because, and we'll see later on in Deuteronomy, those are some of the rules that God gives them, uh, rules of war before they go into war is to actually give them a chance for peace. And as we see here in verse 30, look with me there. It says, But Sion, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by. For the Lord your God hardened his heart and made his heart obstinate, that he might give him into your hand as he is this day. Again, God is showing his sovereignty. He is the one who is causing dread. He is the one who is going to cause people to tremble at the name of Israel. Then Sion came out against us, verse 32, he and all his people to the battle at Jehaz. And the Lord our God gave him over to us, and we defeated him and his sons and all his people. And we captured all his cities at that time and devoted to destruction every city, men, women, and children. We left no survivors. Only the livestock we took as spoil for ourselves with the plunder of the cities that we captured. And this is Moses again speaking once again. From Aor, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, and from the city that is in the valley, as far as Gilead, there was not a city too high for us. The Lord our God gave all into our hands. Only to the, sun, only to the land of the sons of Ammon did you not draw near. That is, to all the banks of the river of Jabbok and the cities of the hill country, whatever the Lord our God had forbidden us. There's a lot going on right here. Let's, let's take a, a look at this and we'll, as we continue to walk through this passage. So how is it that they are able to accomplish and win? Well, the first thing we see is that God hardened Sion's heart. Moses tells us here that the reason he didn't want to let the people through, the reason he didn't want to let the Israelites through is because God had hardened his heart. This does not absolve Sion from responsibility. A scripture is clear that he bears the responsibility. We're told that Sion was unwilling to allow them to pass, which gives him the responsibility. 
But why did he not let them pass? Because God hardened their heart. So how do these things coexist? Well, the very simple thing is we don't really know how they coexist. But Scripture is teaching us that they can and do coexist. And so we take that at face value in some ways. As Romans 9 teaches us, it says it's all for God's purposes. Who he has mercy on whom he has mercy and harden who he wants to harden and does so for his purposes. That's what he did with Pharaoh in Egypt. And Pharaoh was responsible for his sin. But yet God was hardening his heart. And God does that all for his purposes. And that is not a cod. That's not a cop out, nor is it a sidestep. It is the truth of Scripture that God is God, and His ways are not our ways, and they are unquestionable, even when we don't understand them. Next, we see that Moses turns his attention to Og, the king of Bashan, who comes out to meet them. So Bashan uh, is a kingdom that you see to the far north. This strategically would have helped them because it would have protected their right flank as they went into the promised land. So there's some military strategy going on here. Look with me at verse 1 of chapter 3 of Deuteronomy. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan, and Og the king of Bashan came out against us, he and all his people, to the battle at, at Edrea. But the Lord said to me, Do not fear him, for I have given him and all his peoples and his land into your hand, and you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon. Notice he told them not to fear him. He didn't say that to Sihon just interesting, and we'll get to that in just a moment, why, why I think God does that. And you shall do to him as you did to Sion, the king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. So the Lord our God gave into our hand Og, also the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we struck him down until he had no survivor left. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city that we did not take from them. Sixty cities, the whole region of Argob, the kingdom of Og and Bashan. And all these, listen specifically how he describes these cities. All of these cities were fortified with high walls, gates, and bars, besides very many unwalled villages. And we devoted them to destruction, as we did to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, devoting to destruction every city, men, women, and children. But all the livestock and the spoil of the cities we took as our plunder. For only Og, verse 11, for only Og, the king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of Rephaim. Behold, his bed was a bed of iron. Is it not in Rabah, the Ammonites? Nine cubits was its length and four cubits its breadth, according to the common cubit. I'll return to that in just a moment. But notice how he describes these cities. What was it that called the, it caused the Israelites to have so much fear and rebel? They talked about how high the walls were of these cities. And they said, there's no way we can take that out. And Moses is reminding them, remember the cities you were afraid of? Remember the high walls that you were afraid of? We took them out, didn't we? God took them out. Oh, and remember the people you were afraid of? When you read through this passage, Moses very clearly reminds them who these people were descendants of. The Rephaim, he also mentions those who were, who were, uh, who were descendants of the Anakites and Anakim. Remember what they were? They were giants. And he mentions specifically Og's bed. Nine cubits in length, four cubits in breadth. If we were to convert that to our, our current measurement, it's about 13 and a half feet long and about six feet wide. Og was a giant. And he mentions here, is it not in Rabbah of the Ammonites? He's saying, you can go look at his bed. It's somehow, Moses may be referring to some type of museum or something where this bed is on display. You can go and you can look at it and you can remind yourself of how big Og was and God took him out. That group of people you were afraid of, the giants, God fought them. He took them out. A small group of people who had never gone to battle before went in and took them out dispossessed them, not just defeated them, but destroyed their cities, killed them all. And of course, as we come to that, that might bring questions to our mind about how God is dealing with these people. 
as we read this, we see that the Israelites killed them all, regardless of age, men, women, and children. And we'll see later on in Deuteronomy where God tells them, there are specific groups of people I want you to take out. He names them by name. These groups of people, go in, take them out. Don't leave any of them. And so we see by modern definition, it may seem as though God is condoning, not just condoning, but directing and engaging in genocide, taking out whole groups of people. So how do we deal with this? It's here. We have to deal with it. How do we see a loving God deal with people in this manner? Well, the first thing we have to do is remember that we approach God on his terms, not ours. We have to look at what God is doing in the Bible and not we, what we think he ought to be doing. We have to think about what God has revealed about himself and not what we think about God ourselves. There are some attempts at this by scholars to try to say that this is metaphorical, that this didn't really happen. And there are some who would say we shouldn't even trust in the Old Testament because these are here. Well, the problem is when we begin to do that, we don't understand the New Testament. If we don't understand the Old Testament, we don't fully understand the New Testament. And it's also a dangerous thing when we begin to pick and choose what portions of Scripture we believe. We can't approach Scripture and say, I don't like that. I'm not going to believe that. We have to take it all. So what do we do? Well, the first thing, again, and there's many things that sound to us as though they are cop-outs or sidesteps, but it's why we use Scripture to interpret Scripture. We have to acknowledge that there are some things about God that will always remain a mystery. And that's what Isaiah 55 tells us, that our thoughts are not his thoughts and our ways are not his ways. And while that's very simplistic, it's very true. And God doesn't answer to anyone. He doesn't answer to you and he doesn't answer to me. God is free to do and act as he wants by virtue of the fact that he created everything. And there's a lot of aspects to how to answer this, but to put it succinctly and quickly, I think Daniel Block, a, a, a scholar of the Old Testament, puts it this way when he says it's more of an ethic cleansing than an ethnic cleansing. That's his phrase, not mine. More of an ethic cleansing than an ethnic cleansing. These people needed to be removed so that God's plan of salvation could go forward. And he knew that if those people remained, the people of Israel would eventually begin to adopt their ways. And guess what? That happened. So the command was to take these people out so that their idol worship, their pagan ways wouldn't set in in the nation of Israel. And Israel would remain this group of people that would show the glory of God and his salvation to the rest of the world. God wanted this remnant of people to remain pure. Because he knew that outside influence, if left there, would carry their hearts away. So God removed these enemies both for his glory and for his people. So who are these enemies that we face today? We know that there are physical enemies that we face. We know that one of our enemies is the world. We've talked about plenty of that. There are things that people who always come against the work of God, that always go against the things that we would stand for. But there's also an enemy that we often forget. And as C.S. Lewis puts it, sometimes we think too much about them and sometimes we don't think enough. Those are our supernatural enemies, Satan and his minions. There are supernatural enemies that we face each day that work against the Lord's purposes. Turn with me to Ephesians 6. In Ephesians 6, Paul gives us, at the end of his letter, he gives us, instructions about spiritual warfare. Now, why would he put it there? It's because when we read through the book of Ephesians, he's given us theology. And in the chapters four and five, he's given us how we ought to live. And he knows that the powers of Satan and his minions are gonna come, come against us and try to destroy the things that God, or try to destroy the things that God is doing in our lives and that Paul has taught us to do. So he's given us instructions on how we, on making us aware, but then also how to stand against it. Ephesians 6 verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Unfortunately, I think Hollywood and pop culture have shaped our understanding of spiritual warfare more than the Bible. Remember who has authority over those forces. It is Jesus himself. Jesus, God, is sovereign over over all things. So he's therefore sovereign over Satan and his demons and against those that we are at war with. And so as we walk through the rest of that passage and as we read of the different pieces of the armor of God, it gives us ways to fight against that. Notice the offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we know from Scripture that Jesus is the living Word of God. He is the one who fights for us. We see that it is His righteousness that creates the breastplate of righteousness that Paul's described. That in Christ's righteousness, we can stand against the attacks of the devil. It is the truth of God that we put around our waist that girds and holds everything together. And it is the good news of the gospel that we carry on our feet, both as it saves us and as it mobilizes us to go with the good news of the gospel to the world. Nothing can come against us because Christ has claimed us. He's the one fighting our enemies. He is the one fighting our battles. But don't forget that the biggest enemy that we have is ourselves in our own sin. We are sometimes too quick to blame our own failings and shortcomings on Satan. And he certainly tempts us. But don't forget that it's our own sinful nature that causes us to sin. We are responsible for our sin. And there are times where we want the things of the world more than we want God. That's our whole problem. And so we must daily battle our own flesh as we do not naturally want the things of God. We have a sin nature that we will continue to fight even after we are saved. And Paul says this in Romans where he says, I hate the things that I do. And the things that I want to do, I don't do them. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, still battled sin daily. But remember, we are not alone in this fight. And remember that Christ has already won the battle with sin once and for all. So we both at once discipline ourselves. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he beats his body and makes it his slave. But yet we also rest in the grace and the mercy of Christ that when we fail and we will, that we have his grace and his mercy to fall on. So we pray for the Lord to guard our hearts and our minds. We pray for the desire to commune with God through his word and prayer. Yes, we pray for the desire to pray. Because when we are immersed in his word and we are spending time communing with him, God shapes us and sanctifies us and makes us more like him. We pray for the courage in the face of our enemies, both physically and supernaturally. But most of all, we pray for the courage to endure temptation and to resist our sin. So how should we then live? How do we bring closure to all of this? Well, we ask ourselves, does God's faithfulness bring you comfort, or I asked you today, I should say, does God's faithfulness bring you comfort or anxiety? Does God's faithfulness bring you comfort or anxiety? For those of us in Christ, God's faithfulness should bring us comfort. When we know the future that waits us, It becomes easier to remember God's faithfulness. When we remember that one day we will be with him and that all things will be made new and we remember that he's promised that he will meet all of our needs while we are here on earth, it makes it easier for us to have comfort. And we remember that the sufferings of this present time are nothing compared to the surpassing glory of knowing Christ and what awaits us when we see him. And also, when we are confident in the future, it helps us endure and avoid the temptations that we'll face when we're in the wilderness. Chris Gansky, who's a pastor in Milwaukee, teaches it this way. He says, scarcity is what reveals our idols. When we have something we don't want or don't need, our idols will be revealed very quickly, especially when those idols are things that are essential to life, food, other things. It reveals what we look for for comfort, the things that we find as essential. 
And so when we focus on the faithfulness of God, we're comforted by our eternal seal. We're not comforted by temporary fixes. So we remind ourselves of the promises of God. And we'll remember that when we fail, and as I said, there are times when we will, and we turn and we repent. We won't endure the wilderness the same way that Jesus did. Jesus was perfect, and he dealt with it perfectly. But in 2 Timothy 2.13, Paul says, he reminds us that if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So praise God that, yes, God can't not deny his holiness, but he also can't deny his love for us and his creation. And he, so his faithfulness should bring us comfort. But even people who are not in Christ... Even an atheist, someone who doesn't believe in God at all, has idols. There are things that they turn to for comfort. And eventually, those things they turn to for comfort will wane. The comfort that they once brought will go away. And when we hear what we've heard today and hear that God is faithful to his wrath and to his justice, that causes anxiety. Because God is faithful to do what he says he was going to do, to cast those who are not in him away from him in eternity. So if you have not trusted in Christ for salvation, I assure you God is faithful and what we saw today is going to happen one day. And I call on you to trust in Christ. Confess your sin, repent of your sin, and run to Jesus. Turn the cause of your anxiety to a cause of great comfort and joy. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God, that you are faithful. And we thank you, God, that even when we sin, even when we walk away from you, when we trust in things of this world to bring us comfort, Lord, that you're faithful to forgive us when we confess our sin. Father, we pray, Lord God, again, that you would remind us of your faithfulness, that we would sit and we would ponder, that we would meditate, that we would think about how faithful you've been to us, Lord. And God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.